Hey, Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to our online only. My name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. Glad you're connecting as we start the new year. I want to kick off the new year with just a few thoughts on what are we thinking about for our spiritual vitality this year? Right, our big theme of this year, our piece is worth it theme is a vibrant and vital faith. And we're talking about spiritual vitality, right? And this is a time of year where we start thinking and making goals and we look at our future and and what about our health and maybe making goals about work and family and personal growth. Well, what about spiritual vitality? Let me ask this question. What do you think spiritual vitality means? Many people, when they hear that phrase, spiritual vitality, they think like going to church every week, giving in the offering, volunteering. All those things are religious activities, and they're not bad. But we tend to confuse spiritual vitality with religious activity. Because the truth is, I know a lot of people, a lot of people that are very religiously active, but I would consider not spiritually vital because they lack the ultimate measure of spiritual vitality, love. We have this cool little letter in the New Testament called 1 John. And in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, it says, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Now check this out. Everyone who loves, everyone, not every person who follows Jesus, not every person who goes to church, not every person who believes the way I believe, but everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. There's something powerful about this act of love. And the writer says, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, we got to ask the question, well, what is love? Well, for the writer of 1 John, God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, Certainly, the writer of John is writing from a historical perspective and an understanding of God and temple sacrifice and the meaning of the life and death of Jesus and what he's drawing out and what he continues on. And he says this, he says, beloved, since God loved us this much, so much, we also ought to love one another. Really, what the writer is saying is that real genuine love, the love that we can demonstrate that shows that we are born of God, right? That love that is God is a love that heals separation, right? For the writer of this little letter, divine love is expressed in Jesus because Jesus was a way of healing the lie of separation. That's what an atoning sacrifice did in that time. An atoning sacrifice was meant to like bring back together a person with their God in the temple sacrificial system. So for the writer of 1 John, the suffering and the death of Jesus is a demonstration of love, is God pursuing the beloved, the lost sheep, not the other way around, saying there is no separation. I want to be with you. I want to exist with you. I want you to live with with intimacy of the divine. The truth is we do live estranged from the divine. We live east of Eden. But it's not God that separates God's self from us. It's us. It's our selfishness. It's our violence. It's our shame that we feel. And we all of a sudden believe that God is distant. And so we live in a space of estrangement, like the prodigal child who's gone away. We live estranged from that true source of life. And ultimately, we live with a sense of spiritual emptiness. Now, this is what I would think of as spiritual emptiness. Spiritual emptiness, then, is the lack of confidence in the goodness and nearness of the divine spirit, right? When we, when we sense or we experience spiritual emptiness, we feel that we aren't close to the goodness of God, that God isn't near to us. We're afraid of the divine or we're afraid of death because we're gonna have to face God or we live with a sense of anxiety about what is the character of God? Is the character of God wrath? Is the character of God judgment? Now, John addresses this in this letter. He says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, we know that God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Like if I could put it this way, what John is saying is that love is the lead goal for spiritual vitality, right? Spiritual vitality is the lag goal. Are you familiar with lead and lag goals as you're making goals, right? If we say, well, my goal is spiritual vitality, right? Well, how do I get there? Well, what John is saying, if you love, (laughs) you will have spiritual vitality. If you live your life and let love lead you, make your lead goal to love everyone radically, 
then the lag goal will follow. You will sense spiritual vitality. And here's how John describes spiritual vitality. I love it, right? And he starts with God is love. In chapter four, again, he's going, he says, God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them. And then he says this, love has been perfected in us in this. We know that love, in other words, is perfected in us, that God is in us when we have boldness for the day of judgment. Because as he is, as Jesus is, so we are in this world. There's no fear in love, the writer says, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. In other words, if you're still fearing punishment, then you haven't experienced the true perfect love that is God. And so here's what I don't want us to miss. In these few moments we have together as we kind of introduce this idea, spiritual vitality right? The opposite of spiritual emptiness. Spiritual vitality is the confidence to love others the way God loves us. That's what spiritual vitality is. When we experience spiritual vitality, we have confidence knowing that loving others the way God loves us eliminates our fear of God, fear of not having the right thing, uh, down the right doctrines, the right church, all those things. But when we love others fully, the writer of this little letter is telling us, when we love others the way Jesus loves, the way God loves, sacrificially, right? Then that produces a confidence in us that we don't have to be afraid of God. When we see Jesus as this demonstration of God's love, right? Because Jesus loved his people so much that he surrendered his life to show that love. And so spiritual vitality, according to this, this letter in, in John, 1 John, is not confidence in knowing all the right doctrines. Spiritual vitality doesn't flow out of perfect attendance at church or giving all your money. Those are fear-based thoughts. Oftentimes, we, we go and we, we study and we read the Bible because we think if I get my beliefs wrong, God will punish me. Or we go to church because we think if I don't go to church, then God will punish me. And if we don't give our money, then God will punish me. That's fear, fear, fear. That's not spiritual vitality. That's not confidence. Now, those things might make you a good Christian. Let's be honest. You go to church, you give, volunteer. All those things might make you a good Christian, but they don't guarantee spiritual vitality. And spiritual vitality is confidence knowing that loving others the way God loves us is enough. And that's how we experience the divine presence. And so over this next series, we're going to explore how to live this out, how to really live out this kind of love. And we're going to talk about how spiritual vitality begins and grows in our lives as we choose to live a life of vibrant and vital love. That's the name of this series, a vibrant and vital love. And it's about choices that we make. So uh, first of all, this love is vibrant. It's noticeable. It stands out. We are distinguished by it. It's different. And it's vital because it's life-giving. It gives us life. It gives me life. It gives life to others. It solves problems. It heals. And without this vital love that God has demonstrated in Jesus and us demonstrating it in our world, we just destroy ourselves. We, we succumb to our desires for what we want and our selfishness and our fears and our anxieties. And so we're going to explore five choices, five choices over the next five weeks that we can make as people of vibrant and vital love. So next week, we're going to talk about choosing a both and instead of an either or mentality. Then we're going to talk about how a vibrant and vital love chooses action over apathy we're going to explore how if we want to live in a vibrant and vital love, we have to choose forgiveness over bitterness. We have to choose hospitality over hostility. And that's not just for the people that we like, but for everyone. And then we're going to wrap up with this big idea that a vibrant and vital love chooses nonviolence over violence. And throughout these five weeks, we're going to do something really cool. We're going to learn from Scripture. We're going to get wisdom from Scripture. But we're also going to get wisdom from the sermons of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a man who demonstrated and revealed this vibrant and vital love in his own love for friends and enemies, in his love and his work for justice and peace. And this vibrant and vital love is powerful because it does make you and I better people. It makes the world a better place because choosing to live a life of vibrant and vital love creates transformed nonconformists. 
Dr. King called it that. He coined that transformed nonconformist. The reality is too often our love just conforms to the patterns of this world. We love the people that love us. We love the people who can make our lives better. We love those who offer us something in return, but that's not vibrant and vital love. That's not divine love. That's not the love that holds the universe together and heals the brokenhearted. No, that's the love of this world. Dr. King in his sermon uh, on this topic, he talks about these two kingdoms that we kind of live in at the same time. These two realms, and it's the realm of time and the realm of eternity. And in his sermon entitled Transformed Nonconformist, this is what Dr. King said. He said, as Christians, we must never surrender our supreme loyalty to any time-bound custom or earth-bound idea. That's that That's that reality of time, that realm of time that we live in. Because he says, for at the heart of our universe is a higher reality, the eternal reality, God and the kingdom of love to which we must be conformed. That's what this series is really all about. Allowing our lives to be conformed by the choices we make that produce a vibrant and vital love, which results in spiritual vitality, a confidence in the goodness and nearness of God. So we have this great music video for you to just uh, enjoy and let the music kind of wash over your soul. It talks about what can define our lives. This love is demonstrated in Christ crucified. And as you listen to this song, I just want to encourage you to think about what God is inviting you into today. Perhaps you sense God inviting you to engage with this series over the next few months. I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll tune in and explore these choices. Maybe join a group this winter semester and explore the topics and get to know some folks. We have our conversation group that's launching back up on Thursday evening soon, and we'll be exploring these weekly topics. And it's a great opportunity to put some flesh on these choices in our lives. Finally, if you're really interested in these sermons of Dr. King, there's a book that's called Strength to Love. You can order that book, get it right on Amazon, or you can get it on your Kindle, get a paper copy, whichever you like, and maybe read the sermon of Dr. King's that we referenced during that week as just kind of a spiritual discipline to to really draw you into the topic and what we're exploring and the choice we make that produces vibrant and vital love in our lives. Enjoy this song.